All right. So is it cold enough for you outside? Right? It's, I always have a hard time with the cold, but I, I always think the cold kills bugs. It kills cockroaches. The snakes don't like it. You know, all those things in the South, alligators. So I, I think, you know, at least there's some positive out of this cold, right? You got to take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and then you have the facts of life. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, as you know, I've been really, I've been filling in off and on, obviously with Pastor Kevin gone. Um, it's, it's given me really the honor to teach on different topics. Um, I taught through Palm Sunday, which is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So that was, that was awesome. I'd been wanting to do that for four years. So it was kind of neat how that all worked out. Um, I was also able to speak on my second favorite prophecy in Luke when Jesus rolled out the scroll and he read about his first coming. He said, this will be fulfilled. And then he stopped. And then if you go back to Isaiah, the rest of it was about his second coming. So that, that was really neat. Um, and then on Christmas Eve, we learned how God provides through, 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 um, through, the, <laughs> through the ram and through the um, Passover. So we learned about that. And we also learned really about the Jesus' birth, the historical facts about the um, Bethlehem, why Bethlehem played a fact or played a role in it, and also the shepherds. But so all that kind of randomness is going to change. So I really want to focus in on the book of Revelation. So that's kind of my, my thought process going forward when I fill in. We're going to go through Revelation. And, you know, there's, so let's, why don't we start by just, we're going to read through some verses. Um, start there. Start right with the Word of God. So if you could turn, turn your Bibles to Revelation. We're going to start chapter 1, and we're going to read through verse 11. All right. <clears throat> so I'll read. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things, was, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every... I will see even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. But I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Uh, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So we're going to be going starting there. I'm not sure how much we're going to get through today. There's obviously there's a lot to unpack. Um, but you know, really, I want to talk about why I want to go through Revelation. Um, you know, first off, Angie and I, my wife, have started. We started a Bible study really at the kind of the start of the pandemic, and it was to get 
you know, more fellowship, be in God's word more. Um, and, you know, that was what we chose. And we were really blessed um, by having everyone over, by going through the book, by reading it. And, you know, as we're going to read in verse 3, as we did read, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So because I've been blessed by that, because I've literally received that promise that's in this book, I, I want you all to receive that exact same promise. So that's, that's kind of one of the main reasons why I, w I want you to be blessed by this. Um, I also want you to be excited and really give you peace um, about the times we're living in. You know, we're right now, we're in the shadows of these prophecies that are going to be fulfilled. And, um, we sh you know, we should be excited to be a part of this. Um, it's not, not every generation is going to be part of this, only, really only one generation. Um, but by going through this, I want us to understand, you know, that Jesus, he's in complete control of the situation. Even though things, you know, really feel like they're falling apart, it's, it's, all, it's all coming together. And um, so I just, I, I want us to, to have peace with this. Um, like I said, the events in this book are casting shadows on the world, and the shadows really appear to be growing bigger and bigger. Um, prophets like Daniel were told to seal up the book until the end times, and now we have the privilege of being a part of the times when it's, you know, the knowledge is increasing. So, you know, you know, I do believe that we are getting closer and closer to these times. Um, there's a couple of uh, prophecies in chapter 13 that talk about um, one who will have all authority over all the world. So it will, it will have one world leader. And as, as you've seen as we live, you know, everything is just funneling towards that. You know, it's, it's all just kind of going in that direction. And, you know, this is nothing new. I think there's, there's been um, a lot of our Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, whoever, you know, it's been their, their agenda to have more of a global, um, global agenda. So it's all, all about tr really we're funneling towards that, um, that place where one person can be in charge. Um, you know, we've also seen, I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a, there's a thing called the social credit score. And it's really, it's a way to control people. And these things are getting, it's, it's being rolled out in China right now. It's, it's a tr I think it's at a trial stage. But the whole purpose is you're given a social score based on the decisions you make, based on what you buy. You know, are you buying from someone who's socially correct or socially incorrect? You, you know, you, you get a better score, or lower score. Are you buying from someone who, you know, uses green technologies versus non-green technologies? So it's, it's again, it's just going to be a way to control um, what we do. Based on your score, you can either get a, a better credit rating to buy things. You can have lower interest rates. You can have better internet service. You can be able to go, you know, to various events. Um, but it's really the whole, the whole reason is to... Um, control the population. And of course, who's in control of, you know, what the score is? It's the government. So these things, you know, we're seeing take place. It's just, it's giving us evidence that the things in chapter 13 can take place relatively soon. You know, the other prophecy in chapter 13 is um, the one who is given authority will cause all to receive a mark and no one will be able to buy or sell without this mark. And, you know, we see this, the technology nowadays is really at the point where this, this can happen. This could happen soon. Whereas 10 years ago, you know, it was always kind of thought about. We, we saw it in movies. You know, there's different movies that have shown this. But it's, we're really at the point in time where it's possible. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but it, it's just, it's, it's casting you know, their, sh their shadow on it. Um, in Sweden, there actually, there's a thing, it's, it's called the um, microchip revolution, and a portion of the population is getting a microchip installed under their skin, 
And that chip, just like your credit card, has, you know, it gives you the, um, the ability to buy things. It gives you the ability, you know, to sell things, to, to trade money. You know, even our phones, we can do that with our phones. So the technology is there. Um, so we're just, it's getting closer. Um, and even, you know, this chip can hold personal information. It can hold you know, money, your account information, it can hold your vaccine passport, it can hold, you know, all those, all those different things that ultimately control us. So, you know, when I see these things happening, it just shows me that it, it, the ability for the things happening in Revelation are just, it's getting close. So, you know, that's really the other reason why is I want to equip us as saints to know Times are near, um, and just just be prepared, you know, and not be surprised by it, you know. The as I you know kind of mentioned before, the the book lays these things out, so we're not surprised, and we know that God is still in control. So when we see these things happening, it's not like this has caught God off guard, you know. He he laid it all out for us, and it's it's really. I want to comfort, you know, this fellowship by by going through this book. So that's that's really that's why I feel led to go through Revelation. Um, and my last reason why is you know Satan is his primary weapon is deception. I mean that's he's it's always been from you know day one Garden of Eden he uses deception. So I think it's it's critical that we go through the whole book. You know, obviously, Revelation is it's the ending, so we get to know how <laughs> we get to know how it ends, you know, and, and we all know God wins. That's right, we win. Jesus wins, right? So another great reason, you know, we get to celebrate a victory. All right. So before, so that's why I want to go through. Um, I do want to go through a quick outline of the entire book. So if you will, it's in Revelation 1. If you look down to verse 19, it gives you the whole kit and caboodle. There we go. All right. Thank you, Dave. So, so verse 19, it says, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So those are the three things. So the first one is write the things which you have seen. So Jesus tells John to write the things which you have seen. And this is going to be uh, in chapter 1, verses 12 through the rest of chapter 1. So that's the first division of the book. Now the second division, out of the way, he says and write the things which are. So Jesus tells John to write the things which are, and that's going to be the, dis, um, the seven individual letters to the seven individual real churches at that time. Um, and this is going to be chapters 2 and 3. So the second division, the things which are. Okay, pretty easy. Uh, the third division, he says, write the things which will take place after this. And this is going to be uh, chapter 4, verse 1 starts off with, after these things I looked. So it's, there's a clear division. Chapter 4 through, the, through 22 is, is the third division. So it's, it's laid out pretty simply. It's right in the book. It, it kind of tells us the three things. Um, the things that will take place after this, you have the throne room scene in Revelations 4 and 5. You have the... Um, the the, the scroll which Jesus will take and he will unroll it one by one, breaking each of the seven seals, which is the seven seal judgments. You have the sounding of the seven trumpets. You have Satan's perspective in uh, Revelation 12 and 14. You have the seven bowls of wrath in 15 and 16, the fall of Babylon 17 and 19, and then the exciting conclusion at the very end. When um, he will make all things new. So that's, that, to me, is very excited. Now, you're probably going to get awfully sick of these three slides because I'm going to show them every time. <laughs> so just so you know. 
All right, so let's dig in. Let's go to verse 1. All right, so that is my introduction. There we go. All right, so the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. So there's, there's a lot already to unpack. We have the who, we have the what, and we have the why. So first thing, I want to define um, revelation. You know, I think we've heard it a lot, but, but what does it mean? So the, the word revelation is actually, in Greek, is apocalypse. So, you know, I think that's kind of a scary word for us. We think apocalypse is the end of the world. But by definition, it's discovery or disclosure in my favorite 1828 dictionary. Uh, the verb form is to uncover or to unveil. So what we have here, we have the unveiling or the uncovering of Jesus Christ. So it's really, it's unveiling him. Now the world will one day live the unveiling of it, but this book is, it's, kind of, it's our sneak peek to it. It's our, it's our preview to the things which will come. So the unveiling of Jesus Christ to all the world in all of his glory. And we get, we get to read through and understand that. So that's you know, the, the first part. So continuing on in verse 1, it says, Which God gave him in order to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So now we have the why and the who to. Now, I know this book can be intimidating to read and understand, but there's some encouragement in, in this, you know, right from the start. Um, you know, for those of you that might be nervous about reading through, I just, I want you to take comfort in knowing it's specifically written to his servants. So it's written to us, specifically his servants. So if, if you are a, his servant, you know, he's not going to write a book that's going to, he doesn't want to confuse you. He doesn't want to, you know, throw things at you that you're just not going to know. So take comfort in knowing that this book was specifically written to us. It's not, like I said, it's not written to confuse anyone. It's not a secret code, nothing like that. It's, it's pretty straightforward once you dig into it. Um, the other thing to note, it's not written to just Israel. It's not written to just the body of Christ, or it's not written to unbelievers. It's written to show his servants the things which will take place. So this brings me to a point that I need to make. Um, when studying scripture, you know, it's very important to understand who the book is written to or who it's written for. You know, as an example, we have, we have the Pauline epistles. And they're written to the saints at various churches, and it's written to the members of the body of Christ. You know, Paul, Paul had what he called my gospel, and that was salvation by grace through faith received, you know, it's the free gift by faith in the finished works of Christ. Not of our own works, but of finished works of Christ. So when we go through, you know, the Pauline epistles that directly speaks to us, that is, that is the, what's called the dispensation that, that we're in, the dispensing of truth that really ap applies to us. Now, it's, it's slightly different from before Christ was born, and even while Christ was on earth. You know, it's, it's awfully hard for those people that were living when Christ was to believe in his crucifixion, his resurrection, you know, dying on the cross for, for their sins when it, it never happened, right? It's just, it's kind of a timing thing. So that's, Paul called that the dispensation of the grace of God. So it's, you know, the point being, it's just, it's very, um, it's crucial to know who this book is written to. Um, so with, with that in mind, I do want to turn to Daniel 9. Um, so if you could, everybody turn to, to Daniel 9. And we're just, I just want to make a, a point that goes along with the who. And I've, we've read this with me a couple times before, but I just want to make this point. So Daniel 9, verse 26 and this, this is the, what's called the 70-week seven, prophecy that was given to Daniel. And it's, it's all about Israel. 
So picking it up in 26, it says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So verse 26 is what happens in the weeks of 63 to 69. You know, each week is a seven-year period. You know, we've seen that um, it's accurate to the day when during the triumphal entry. And all these things through the 69th week have taken place. But then when you pick it up in the 70th week in verse 27, which is the tribulation, that it hasn't occurred. So Israel is basically that prophetic timeline has been paused between weeks 69 to 70. So we're, we're basically living between between those two sentences or between those two times. Um, and I believe in, like in Romans 11.25, it says, Blindness has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And that time Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So all the promises that he revealed to Daniel in these 70 weeks, they will still take place. Even though the last week hasn't happened, they, they still will take place. But there's, there's some teachings out there that say the, the Gentiles will replace Israel. And I just, I want, that's, that's not true. You know, all these promises will still take place. We're just, we're, we're kind of waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to happen. It's like there's got to be one more Gentile who accepts the Lord as their Savior before this timeline kicks back in. You know, and it, so that's, it's, I just, I want us to understand that because if you want to turn back to Revelation, most of the book of Revelation re really applies to Israel and it does not apply to us. Um, but it is there for our, for our edification. It's there for our understanding. It's there for our learning. Um, there's no mention of the body of Christ in the book of Revelation. Now, chapters 2 and 3 talk about the church, but, it, but really the body of Christ isn't even mentioned here. So it's, it's critical we understand who um, this book is written to so we don't take too much information out of it. You know, we don't, we don't want to put ourselves in the middle of the tribulation because it, it doesn't talk about us being there. So just, just want to make note of that. Um, our prophetic clock, if you will, for the body of Christ, it's not, it's not defined. There's not any, like, this will happen at this, this date like it was for Israel. Um, it can happen anytime. You know? So it's just, um, the Bible says that Jesus doesn't know, only the Father knows the time. So, all right, so let's continue on in verse 1. Uh, it says, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. There it is, servant John. Uh, so this is, the, this is the John whom Jesus loved. He's sitting right next to him there, you can see him. Uh, he bore witness to the word of God. He was basically there as he just wrote what he saw. You know, he, he wasn't adding to it. He wasn't subtracting to it. That was his purpose, was he was just writing what he saw. Now, this is the John of the Gospel of John, a first John, second John, third John. Um, and we know that it was written on the book of, or on the island of Patmos. Now, tradition will teach us that John was boiled in oil um, and survived that. And then after that period of time, he was sent to Patmos, which was, it was basically, it's a work, work camp. You know, he was enslaved to do um, hard labor. And 
at that time, really after he was went through that hard labor, he he wrote wrote this book. Now, you know, from our standpoint, I think this can also be of encouragement. You know, John had been through an awful lot. He'd seen all the other apostles martyred. He saw Jerusalem destroyed with, you know, I don't know the number, a million, you know, Israel's killed in in the battle for Jerusalem. Um, So he saw that destruction. He saw how Rome blamed the Christians on why it happened. And um, a lot of people were martyred because of it. Um, so he, he went through a lot. And then if it's true that he was did hard labor at the age of over 90, I just, you know, I can't imagine that. It's, it's, it's a hard life if, if that's what he, he, he went through. Um, so to have this vision at the end of his life um, is, had to be a huge blessing for him. You know, to have an, uh, be able to write another book, um, another, you know, um, part of the Bible is, it was a huge blessing for him. And to actually see these things. He's the only one who's seen, seen these things, who's seen the risen Christ seated at the right hand. So it's, um, it's pretty incredible. So for all of us, you know, we might be going through hard times um, and, you know, illnesses, sicknesses, whatever, you know, kids being rough <laughs> the whole bit. But um, just note, you know, God, God will use that. God can use all of that. Um, for his benefit and to, you know, edify us. And, you know, when we look back at those times, it just, just, in, just some encouragement um, to, to, to stick with it, to, to be joyful in all things. Amen? Okay. So the Lord may choose um, to bless us, as Ephesians 3.20 says, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, even in difficult circumstances. So it's um, yeah, pretty amazing. Uh, so as I said, continuing on to verse 2, um, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things he saw. So he's just stating that I'm just, I'm just going to write what I saw, is essentially what, what he's saying there in verse 2. All right, on to verse 3. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So blessed is he who reads. So this is the only book in all the Bible that promises to bless you if you read and, um, what does it say? Read and hears. So just by being here, reading and hearing, you will be blessed. So like I said before, that's my main reason for for doing this. So it's probably going to take some time to get through um, if we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter teaching this. So I'm going to encourage you guys, go make it a priority. Read through it yourself. Um, And, you know, if there's questions, ask ask people here. Ask me, ask, ask an elder. But really just encourage you just to just to read through. There's nothing wrong with just reading through um, the whole book because you are promised a blessing with this. And we all know God keeps his promises, right? Okay. Now, there is a blessing, and then at the end there's also a warning. <laughs> so, you know, so again, take the good, take the bad. Um, in 18 and 19, it's a, it's a warning for those who hear and will add or subtract from the book. So just just take it as as it's written. You know, we, we don't want to be adding or subtracting from the book. I really don't want to do that as, as teaching. Um, so I just just try to be careful with that. But um, just read through it. You will be blessed. All right. Uh, continuing on to verse four, it says, "John to the seven churches which are in Asia." So John's going to be writing you know, sending this off to seven specific churches, to real churches in Asia. Um, when we get to that point, we'll probably go through it a little bit a little bit more in depth. But just know, you know, there's, there's a lot of fellowships in that area, a lot of churches in that area. Um, he just sent it to seven of them. 
So that's that to me is interesting. Why just those seven? So if you guys want to take that back and think about that a little bit, um, we'll discuss it when we get when we get to that. Uh, continue on to verse four. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So, you know, this this is a description of, of Jesus. He is, he was, and is to come. Um, and we have, you know, several scriptures that talk about this. In Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created. So we know that God was around in the beginning. It, down in Verse 26 of Genesis 1, it says, Let us make a man in our image. So here you have the us is the Holy Trinity. So Jesus was around in the very beginning. So Scripture is just, just backing this up. Uh, in John 1, 1, in the Gospel, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. So again, Jesus, he was around before all time began. And, and really, you know, he's outside of the realm of time. You know, everything to him is, it's right now, <laughs> right? So he's outside the realm of time, and that's, it's a perfect description of this. He was, is, and is to come. All right, uh, going on to verse 5. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the uh, kings of the earth. So Jesus Christ, he's described a few different ways. He, he has he, titles. Faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler over the king of the earth. And really for the rest of our time, I kind of want to camp on the idea of faithful, faithful witness. Now, again, going back to the Greek, w witness um, is is from the word. Oh, I can use the pointer. No, I can't. Uh, Martis, which is where we get our word martyr from. So, witness you know, was used to, to to derive the word martyr from, which to me is very interesting. Uh, the original idea is one who has faith so strong that he's willing to die for it. Okay? So Jesus is this faithful witness or faithful martyr. He's, he has faith so strong that he is he's willing or he would die for it. So it's, it's such a sweet picture of, of Jesus um, being that faithful witness. Um, but now, you know, what was what was he a witness to? You know, it's, and so what I want to do is let's turn to John, and we'll start in verse one. I'm just going to hit on a couple of scriptures here to show about what he was witness to. John chapter one, verse eighteen. says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So this is saying that Jesus is witness or declaring who God the Father is. No one's seen him except for Jesus. So that's, that's what he is witness to. So let's turn a little bit farther to chapter 14. Staying in John. And this is verse 8 and 9. It says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So again, Jesus is witness to who the Father is. That, that, was his, that was his purpose. One of his purposes. John 18. Let's go a little, a little bit farther. 
John 18, verse 37. says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So again, this is his purpose. He wants to bear witness to the Father. He wants to bear witness to the truth. And as the Greek, he's... He's doing this with faith so strong that he's willing to die for it. And, and he's right in the middle of it with, in this verse with Pilate. So, so that is what Jesus is, is witness to. Now, I also want to talk about us from an application standpoint. What, what are we witness to? Right? We, we need to be faithful witness as well. So what do we need to be witness to? So with that, I want to turn to Acts 26, and I'm going to try to make a couple connections here. And so Acts 26, verse 12. This is Paul recounting his conversion. All right, verse 12. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, here it is. But rise and stand in your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. So, so Paul is given this order to witness, you know, talk about what he has seen and then the things that he will later be revealed to him. So on this journey, he's seen the, he's seen the risen Christ. He's seen, the, he's seen the Christ that's already been to the cross, that has, you know, been to hell, three days later came back and ascended to heaven. So... Now his he's he's been told go go share this, okay. So with that, I want to turn to Second Timothy to kind of make the connection, you know, from Jesus to Paul to us. So 2 Timothy 2, and we will start with verse 1. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul is telling Timothy, you know, all these things that I've bore witness to, now you, it's, it's your job to go share that. Go share that with, with faithful men. Teach that to faithful men. And that's really, as, you know, members of the body of Christ, that's, that's what we should be doing. We should be taking the gospel of grace and sharing that with other faithful men. It could be, you know, Mothers with daughters, it could be fathers with sons, you know, your your friends, your family, you know, all these things. Once once you see someone who is, you know, who, who seems to be asking questions and who appears to have, you know, that 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 faith that they're, they're looking for something more than just themselves, you know, it's it's our jobs to go to go bear, bear witness of those things, of the risen Christ, of the Christ who's 
who died on the on the cross and rose again. So that's you know we as members of the body of Christ that that is our faithful witness. And you know I just want to encourage you all to you know keep sharing keep sharing the gospel. Um, you know I think Lisa once told me <clears throat> you know if if a if if there's a burning building, you know it's our job. We we want to go save those people, and essentially all you know those around us are in a burning building if if they don't believe, and it's you know it's 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 wrong for us to not go pull those people out of that building. So just just go share, go share your faith, go share who Jesus is, go share what Paul saw um, with as many as you can. You know that that is what we need to to bear witness to. And you know, if you turn in just a couple, maybe one page, I don't know, um, chapter three in First Timothy, verse sixteen and seventeen. S- s- correct, Second Timothy, chapter three. Thank you. It says, "All Scripture is given by inspiration of God." and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So he is equipping us to do this work. So don't, you know, I don't want you to be nervous. I don't want you to, you know, think how, how can, why would he choose me to go share the truth, to bear witness, to have faith so strong we're willing to die for, you know. But he's he's equipped us. He will put us in those situations, and he will equip us with the truth. He will give us the words to say. He will give us everything we need, you know, to do those. And it 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 says it in scripture. It's like you know, don't don't put t- all this time and energy. You know, I will I will give you the words exactly when you need it. So just you know. Know the facts, know the truth, be in that situation, and just share. Let God work through you. Don't, don't you know, put the brakes on what God is going to do through you. So with that, um, that's all I have for today. I think that's enough. Um, we're going to pray out. So if um, someone wants to go get the worship team, which is probably teaching Sunday school, um, I'd appreciate. So let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your magnificent revelation, um, which you gave to us, so that we may know more um, about the things that will take place very shortly. Um, Thank you for giving us this book to show us that you're in complete control of a time and a place that, you know, doesn't always feel like it's in control. But um, thank you for showing us these things so that we know you already know what's going on. It gives me peace. So I I thank you for that. Um, Thank you for unveiling your truths, giving us grace and peace. And I ask that you just continue to give us knowledge of your revelation and help us understand really you more and what this final chapter, what this, you know, what this final story has in store for us. Um, You know, as I said, we win. So we're also grateful for that. So with that, in Jesus' name.